Hey, this is Tom Luganbill at ESPN, and you're watching Chopping It Up with Buck. On this week's edition of Chopping It Up with Buck, I have my good friend Tom Luganbill. Man, we spent some many a nights over at uh, <laughs> Rushmore Drive at ESPNU. Had some great conversations, talked ball, did a lot of shows together. How you doing, man? I'm good, man. I'm doing really, really well. It's funny you were talking about you know doing so many shows for all those years, and we were all on a text chain the other day talking about how you know you think back, and we would do like three three hour live shows in one day you know yeah. most people you watch college football live or you watch it it's a half an hour you might be on an hour preview show we were doing three hour shows live at a time and then those late saturday nights where you're recapping college football like there's a part of me that misses it and then there's another part of me that says no way like i look <laughs> back i'm like how did we do that and i remember anise Schroff yeah coming down from bristol and they didn't do those types of shows in Bristol. So he comes down to ESPNU, and he's like, I, I'm not prepared for this. You know, I, I'm used to doing a half an hour show, which is basically 22 minutes of on-air content. You're out of there, and you go. And then he came down to Charlotte, where we're at, and it's one show. I mean, he's like, yeah, we even have the A's and the B's and the C's on the rundown. And he goes, on our shows, we got into, like, the K's and the M's and the L's. Hey, remember when we were going to meetings to see, do we have any X's or Y's today? Oh, or yeah. Remember how long those rundown sheets were? We're like, okay, where's the end? When, when is, I remember when we would do the experts. We're all sitting there in a row. And I'm like, yeah. all right, where's the last segment? We're at a just turn of the, turn of the pages. So, but, yeah, man, those, those are a lot of good times. But I'm, I'm doing good, man. You, you know, yeah. you talk about recruiting. Um, it's been um, – it's been odd to say the least. I mean, when you're basically having to recruit. Now, the one thing I will say, and I actually brought this up with the NFL draft because I think it applies there too. Yeah. As you know, recruiting has become such a rat race. You know, everybody has to be in on the kid and you've got to identify the kid and then you've got to offer him to have a chance to, to recruit him. Because if you don't offer him early and everybody else does and now you're out of it, well, guess what that leads to? A lot of misses. Because yeah. it's hard yeah. to evaluate, you know, a 14- and 15-year-old buck. And now all of a sudden, you're, you're sitting there saying, well, we offered this guy. And then two years later, you've come across 20 other guys that you might think are better. So now you're juggling those balls in the air, and it makes it really difficult. So what's happened here in the last four or five months is it's really allowed coaches and personnel staff to maybe slow it down and tap the brakes a little bit, mm. spend more time on film. Spend more time massaging that board. Spend more time talking to people, whether it's a guidance counselor or a janitor or an athletic mm -hmm. trainer. Like they, used to, avoid, like they used right, to do. Right, they used to do. Right, like, remember, like, look at the NFL. So you get the NFL, they have all of this scouting material, and they've got all of these resources, right? And they spent months and months and months studying what a guy's done for three or four years. And the next thing you know, they go to one pro day, for two hours mm -hmm. or one um, NFL combine and they magically fall in love with this one guy. Yeah. Right? And you're sitting there kind of looking, well, how is that two hour period trumping everything you've been studying on this guy? Mm -hmm. and so I think the fact that there weren't pro days and the NFL guys had to do so much more digging on players. I bet you we'll look three, four, five years from now. We'll see more players will have panned out out of this last draft because more information seeking was acquired and led them to make better decisions. And I'm hoping the same thing happens in recruiting. And I think what we may see if that happens, both in the pros and college, that we're going to see that happening more. Like there's not going to be a situation where we fall in love or you get enamored with the kid who's 14 or 15 and, you know, has upside, yeah. but you just don't know where they're going to be. And I sure. think that that, that's the part that I'm intrigued by. Even like today, we just heard that the Big Ten is only going to play in its conference. Yeah. And yesterday, the Ivy Leagues decided, hey, we're, we're not playing until the spring. How mm -hmm. is that going to – I don't think the, the, the Power Fives is going to – they're not going to look at that in any way, shape, or form. They're either going to start playing and stop, in my opinion, or mm -hmm. they're going to figure out another method if things get out of hand. What do you think with that? Well, as it relates to recruiting with that, in, in, re, in that regard, one of the things that has concerned me in recruiting is we have seen a rash of verbal commitments come 
over the last three or four months. Well, that means kids have been verbally committing without going on campus, yeah. without taking an official visit, without being face-to-face with the area coaches and the coordinators and the head coach. Head coaches and the assistant coaches had no spring evaluation period. So what I fear and what I do think will happen, it will settle down, but we're going to have a period in the fall where if they allow the coaches to go on the road and start recruiting, if they allow kids to come on campus in official and unofficial capacities, we're going to see a huge spike in decommitments because the kids that all made these choices really didn't have all the information. And so it will be interesting to see, you know, take a team like North Carolina, Mac Brown does such a remarkable job, um, Jeremy Pruitt at Tennessee yeah. off to a fast start. Well, now they got to hold on. I mean, it's mm. like having a 500 pound Marlin on the line, <laughs> but he's 500 miles away. Right. Yeah. So you're just sitting there doing this. And so I think that you'll, you'll see a little bit of that and then, and then it'll, e- it'll even itself out and work itself out. I have no idea how they're planning on treating the early signing period as opposed to maybe the late signing period. I think a lot of that will dep- be dependent upon what happens in terms of, when the season starts, if it starts on time, if it's delayed, I think all that stuff, you'll see a trickle down effect that will, that will impact recruiting. What I do know, and the good news is if you are a, a college coach or you're a university or a fan of a, of a school, the technology is so advanced now mm-hmm. that, and I've spoken to, to a lot of coaches where they went and they put together these PowerPoint virtual seminars that basically was the equivalent to an an official visit. Now, it wasn't a seminar that was done over two days, but they've been able through their graphics department, social media, and Skype, and Zoom, to be at least get virtually face-to-face with kids, show them things, do walking tours throughout the facility, but it's not the same, Buck. You know, it's not the same as a, a game day atmosphere. It's not the same as being on campus and participating in their camp in the summer and being coached by that position yeah. coach that's recruiting you. That's a whole different deal that we've missed out on recruiting. So there, there's just so many unknown variables, I think, that are still at play here. Now, you grew up around this. Your dad was yeah. a coach. I mean, you had a chance to grow up and be a part of it. I, I forgot that you were a twin, your sister Carrie. Yeah. yeah that's wild. So but take us back to watching your dad, Al Luganville, coach and develop players. I know at A-State you got to run up the mountain and do all the yeah. different things with the guys. What did that – that had to have an influence on you and why you got in the ball, but also coaching and playing and everything else. Right. Well, let me start off by answering that question by saying probably the reason why I love football as much as I do is because growing up, it was never forced upon me. Mm-hmm. My, my, my dad had been a coach since I was born or before I was born. If I wanted to come to the office with the other kids, I came to the office. If I wanted to go into the locker room, if I wanted to run around at practice, if I wanted to be on the field pregame, I could. If I didn't want to do that and I wanted to go play the flute, that was fine too. So I think the fact that football wasn't pushed on me because it was in my family and it was something that my dad did – allowed for me to generate a love for it on my own. Mm-hmm. And then as you get older and you're in those locker rooms and um, you're on those buses from the hotel to the stadium, mm-hmm. and you're doing things at seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, or even when you get into your teen years that most kids don't get to do yeah. and would die to be able to do. Those are the times when you become mature enough to really cherish it. And you get a sense of, you know, how unique your childhood is, how unique the profession is that your dad's in. You know, most people's parents aren't in the public light. They're not in the newspaper or on the news or on the radio. Um, and though, so you, 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 and there's good and bad that goes with that, you know? Yeah, and yeah. so, you know, because there's two kinds of coaches <laughs> in the world. There's ones that have been fired. There's ones that will be. And yeah. I was real fortunate, but my dad didn't, had never been fired from a job in this coaching profession until I was in my sophomore year of junior college, my last year at Palomar College, one week before our national championship game. Now, this is why that was special. You played at the junior college ranks, you play on Saturdays, just like major college football. So for almost two years, unless my dad had a bye, he never got to see me play. I think he saw me play twice in in Mm -hmm. two years. We were uh, uh, 10 and one my freshman year. 11-0 11-0 my sophomore year. We won the national championship in 1993. 
and he got fired five days before that game. So he got to come see that game. All yeah. right. And so that was a big deal for me. And, um, and I think it was a big deal for him uh, too, but it, it, it is a great profession. It's a great game to grow up in because you learn all the ins and outs. You learn the mm-hmm. equipment side, the athletic training side, the administrative side. For me, you know, just the recruiting side. I remember, I remember my dad um, in 1991, I think it was, was uh, interviewing and hiring his running backs coach at San Diego State. And the two applicants that were in the building that day on separate occasions were Urban Meyer and Sean Payton. And mm-hmm. Urban was at Colorado State at the time working for old Bruce. And Sean had been a GA for my dad, had moved on to, uh, I want to say Miami of Ohio yeah, for one year was, yeah. under, Rand- yeah, under Randy Walker. And that was when you could have restricted earnings coaches. You can't do that anymore. And so he ended up hiring Sean because he was familiar with him and he knew him. And then, you know, you fast forward a year. And I used to go into all the different position meetings and I would sit in on the meetings with the different coaches and the players. And I remember – one day I would go in and I'd sit in in the D-line meeting and there's Leroy Glover. And then the next day I was sitting in on the receiver meeting and there's, you know, Don A. Scott and Oz Hakeem and those guys. And then I would sit in in the running backs meeting and the guy coaching the meeting is Sean Payton and Marshall Falk sitting right next to me, <laughs> one of your teammates, yeah, right? So, exactly. you know, when you're 15 years old, that's pretty cool, man. And you, you get to learn – you know, a lot of really, really great aspect of, of the game and the sport and the culture that goes along with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. We'll take a short break on Chopping It Up with Buck. We'll be right back with Tom Luganville. Hi, guys. Dee Dee Wong here. And as you guys may know, I am an international award-winning speaker. I'm an entrepreneur, and I love investing in amazing products out there, one of which is now Thin Energy. It is a plant-based beverage. It has really huge hydration benefits. My favorite is the peach passion. I am so excited about this project. It's called Thin Energy. Please check it out. All right, I'm back with Tom Lugan, Bill Lukes. We were talking a little bit about it, and you mentioned Marshall Falk, and that's interesting because he had a great story about your dad when he was a freshman trying to get break in the lineup, a seven seven string, and you were you know you went to those games and yeah. you saw. But tell us from your perspective of watching him have that breakout day uh, as a freshman, coming from the seven string running back to getting on the field, the first play fumbling. He said your dad read him the ride act. I don't think he he, t- he lost the ball the rest of his career there. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was interesting that he came in as a freshman. And remember, in the early 90s in those days, true freshmen didn't play. They all redshirted, right? I mean, everybody did for the most part. Yeah, that was true. just part of getting acclimated to college. And you knew when you were getting recruited. It's not like it is now that you were going to go and you're going to redshirt. Well, at that time, there was a span of, of two recruiting classes, my dad's first three years there at San Diego State, where they got some guys that probably should have gone to, at that time, would have been Pac-10 school. So Darnay Scott, Marshall Falk, uh, Leroy Glover, Kyle Turley. Okay, yeah. so these yeah. were guys that were power five talents that they had beat guys on in recruiting, so they get them in there. And at running back, you know, everybody's heard the story. The only reason why Marshall actually went to San Diego State because my dad was the only one that would actually give him a chance to play running back. Everybody wanted him to play corner. And you know what? My dad will tell you that if he would have been at a Power 5 school recruiting him, he would have wanted him to play corner too. Yeah, yeah. he would have said, yeah, of course I want him as a corner. He's going to be a difference maker. But at a place like San Diego State where you're trying to build the program, you want an impact player no matter how you can get him. You want to play running back, the story at running back. And that's all Marshall wanted to hear. But when he signed on – there were two backs. One was T.C. Wright, and the other one was Wayne Pittman, which is Michael Pittman's older brother. That's Those great. two guys had split time as the starter um, the year before Marshall signed. So it was not only a bunch of guys in front of him, it was two guys that had played a lot of football. So he not only had to climb the ladder, he had to beat out two essential returning starters. And he was about 5'10", about 180 pounds. So he kind of looked like a slot receiver. He didn't really look Mm -hmm. like a running back. And to this day, and I'm not speaking out of turn, and you know this because you've been around him, you've been in the locker room with him. (laughs) If you're talking about the physical makeup of what you think an elite athlete should look at, okay, or look like, Marshall Falk doesn't fit any of it. 
You could line up a hundred athletes, <laughs> yeah, cover true. their faces, and I promise you, if you said which one's Marshall Falk, the one who's actually Marshall Falk would be the last one you pick. He <laughs> just doesn't have that look. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, right? I know exactly what you're talking about. And you're looking at him, you're going, "How does this guy move the way he does?" Because he's he's literally human silk. I mean, yeah, everything yeah. is just smooth and effortless, and um, and he's one of those guys that looks like he's running on clouds, yet nobody's ever catching him. Yeah, I always and, um, people, if he was on Dancing with the Stars, and I don't know, oh, if yeah, I mean, because he would just stop and move. The the ability to to right. go from zero to sixty is unbelievable, and not lose any balance, not yeah. lose any agility. He wouldn't fall down. He wouldn't trip over himself, and he was just he was remarkable. And what people didn't realize, which they later found out, especially when he moved on to the Rams, was how good of a pass catcher he was. I mean, yeah. you could literally line him up at wide out and play him every single snap. Well, Ted Marchabrota did that with him a lot. When he first yeah, okay. got to Indy, there were matchup times where they used – when you line up a, a running back, normally they'd put a, a, a linebacker or a safety. Right. Teams stopped doing that because, remember, Ted came from Buffalo where they had Thurman, and Thurman would do some of that factor back yeah. stuff and the, the K-gun. So they would put Marshall out, and he was running outs as a rookie just – Dylan on people. I mean, our right. cornerbacks were like, yo, this guy is pretty damn good. We had some good <laughs> yeah. corners in India at the time. <laughs> yeah, so, he's yeah. he's a special one, man. He's he's a different breed. So, you know, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, he had to work his way up. I remember yeah. um, it was interesting. He came in as a true freshman. He didn't look the part, you know, because he was undersized, he's underdeveloped. But he he leg pressed a thousand pounds. I yeah. mean, he was like he just his had a natural half. Yeah. Low, yes, he had a thick lower half and and um you know, he was a, a healthy player for the most part throughout college for the majority of his, of his NFL career. He was, um, he was one of those guys, like you referenced, my dad read him the ride. I can, I actually can, I can remember that instant of, of that fumble. And you're, you're right. Like he was one of those guys when something happened and he was told something, it didn't happen twice. Exactly. Right. And you um, never made the same mistake generally. <laughs> and I'll never, I'll never forget. Cause I was on the sideline for all those games. So it's a Saturday night, Jack Murphy stadium, university of Pacific. TC Wright gets hurt. So now it's Marshall and Wayne Pittman. And it becomes very a pit, uh, apparent that within a few snaps of them each take it can snaps, it's going to be Marshall's show and 386 <laughs> yards and seven touchdowns later. And understand this is, you know, we've seen that happen. We've seen LaDainian Thomas, and we've seen yeah. some other guys do that. But in 1991, nobody was doing that. If you rushed for 300, and that was prior to the internet or nothing, and that was national news. Because, I mean, seven touchdowns in one game from a running back at the college level, I mean, it's, it, was, it was a pretty cool day. What was it like growing up in San Diego? San Diego is one of my favorite towns. I went to UCLA, so I like L.A., mm -hmm. But the very first time I went to San Diego was to play a game, actually my second college football game. And it was, I mean, I have, that, that is a city that I have just always loved. It's absolutely gorgeous. The cost of living is outrageous. I don't know <laughs> if I could ever bring myself to live there again. Everything you hear about it, weather-wise, beaches, things to do, they're all true. In fact, they're probably all understated. Mm -hmm. And so it was fun for me because I um, – when we moved there, we first moved inland until we figured out where we were going to be. And then we ended up moving to the coast and we were north of La Jolla and ended up living in Del Mar. And, and so I grew up for the most part kind of as a football playing beach kid. And, but at that time, what was getting really, really prevalent was seven on seven. All right. This was late eighties, early nineties and high schools were getting together in Southern California. So whether it was Lincoln High School or Helix or yeah. Morse or Oceanside or El Camino or Vista, all these schools that were prominent football factories. I mean, that, you know, everybody from Marcus Allen to you name them, there's such, such great talent. Yeah. yeah. So, and you know that coming from Houston, it's the same thing. Um, and then, so I was always all around San Diego, either because of a high school thing or because of my dad being at San Diego State and, you know, being on different – you know, campuses. So I kind of experienced a wealth of living conditions. I was always, I was either inland, I was either down at San Diego State, I was at my high school, which was across I-5, or I was on the beach. And, um, you know, I went to high school, I went to Torrey Pines High School, it's where Tony Hawk went. Um, John Lynch was a senior my freshman year, he's a oh, Torrey wow. Pines yeah. alum. And, um, 
And so that was a, that was a great experience, but the, the whole, um, there's, let me, let me say one thing too about, because it leads into my junior college experience, yeah. but out West, and you know, this being at UCLA, you have so many walks of life in terms of ethnic backgrounds. Yeah. You have white, black, Polynesian, Samoan, mm -hmm. Tongan, all right? You have Asian. You have a huge Hispanic population. And it's been that way for as long as I could ever remember. I mean, I grew up on the West Coast. It was either in Southern California or Arizona. I was born in, 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 in Pasadena. And so when you grow up and that's all you know, that's the norm. And unfortunately, that's not how much of our society has grown up, yeah. you know? And... Um, so I remember, you know, I'm always in a college locker room. So I'm with these older, these older guys or college level athletes from all walks of life. And mm -hmm. then when I, when I head to the junior college ranks, Buck, I mean, you've got it. You, you know how junior college could be. I, you know, I was an <laughs> academic qualifier. I yeah, went to junior yeah, yeah. college by choice. But yeah. Can't yeah. say the same for some of the dudes <laughs> I was playing with. Now. Some of them guys. <laughs> Their whole thought was, if it's fun, I want to do it. If yeah. it ain't fun, I don't want no part of it. So school and moving on beyond junior college probably wasn't their same priority like it was mine. But the, the relationships and the, the different walks of life that you experience and that you're around, I think particularly being a coach's kid is one of the most healthy environments mm -hmm. you could possibly be a part of. Yeah, I mean, because, you know, the West Coast is, 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 is like anywhere else. There's pockets of places where, as a black man, I know I'm not really wanted there. Mm -hmm. But I also know, too, that I can go to a lot of places and they're going to be cool because it's, it's right. the vibe. It's certain it's things. I, I right. Tell you. And then playing with guys from all over gets you that exposure, too, because you go to sure. junior college. You go to Georgia Tech, which is a totally different setting. Totally different. Still, uh, the locker room seems to bring some of those things together. And, and it's interesting you say that because there, there were things going on then that we know whether it was, you know, if you were in school, Rodney King, that, that episode yeah. taking place around the time you were in school or yeah. you know, any, any, any social injustice, there's a lot of conversation in the locker room. And some of it, you know, it gets really heated. But then other sure. parts of it is, hey, you know, I didn't think about that. I, don't, I didn't think about that in regards to this. And it's I, a healthy discussion. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's why it's interesting now, like you're seeing these young men that are speaking out. I think it's, it's unbelievable and it's fascinating that they have a voice and it's being heard, even on the college level, more well, than anything. I think too, Buck, we didn't have, there was no medium for that then. Yeah. Uh, and you were a little bit before me, but there was no internet. There was no social media. There was no phone in the palm of your hand. Mm -hmm. So as a, a student athlete, at the collegiate level, what voice did you have? You didn't yeah. have one. Yeah, you had one internally. You could shape and mold and impact and have an effect on your own little bubble of culture, mm -hmm. right? But there was no far-reaching arm because we didn't have the technology that allows it now. Now, when, with that said, when you finished up your career at East, Eastern Kentucky, mm -hmm. did you know you were going into coaching or what was the, you know, did you want to, I know you wanted to try to play in the league some, what yeah. was the next step for you? So I went, I went, I finished up at Eastern and then I, I knew I was going to go to grad school. So what okay. I did is I, 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 I joined NFL Europe as a quality control. And then that afforded me to go to grad school during the off season. So as opposed to going, I almost went to North Carolina and was a GA for Mac Brown. Okay. And then I just, and really, to be honest with you, what steered me away from that, I experienced my father's end of his tenure at San Diego State, which was so difficult and so bitter. And I was old enough to really feel it mm -hmm. and understand that, man, there's a lot of things about college athletics that I don't want to have to deal with. And I think there's still a lot of coaches that feel that way. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I gave it a lot of thought because the one thing about professional football, as you know, is it's player evaluation and coaching. It's results or non-results. And then you weed through the roster to fix it all. All right. And so that, I really gravitated towards that. So um, going to grad school, I went to Marshall. I ended up getting my master's degree from there. I played two seasons in the Arena Football League, and I used that money to pay for my grad school. Okay. So I used the money that I made there 
paid for my graduate degree, so I was able to get I was a scholarship athlete, obviously, undergrad. Um, so, but I came out of, of my schooling, both undergrad and postgrad, with no student debt, so that's something I'm very proud of, and then um, became a, a graduate assistant, uh, or no, excuse me, a, a quality control on the professional football level, and then um, uh, I had an opportunity as a young coach to be a coordinator in the arena league and I was I was a little bit concerned but I said you know what I'm at this point I'm 23 years old 20 yeah 23 years old I was a coordinator then I had an opportunity to go be a special teams coordinator so now this is two different areas of the game that I was able to to dive into which then led to, at the age of 25, uh, the Arena Football League started a sub-league at Arena Football 2, and I was hired as, as a head coach. And in that league, in that league, because of your, you know, your budget restrictions and your roster limitations and really your, your, staffing, your staffing and your personnel, yeah. you didn't have a lot of help, man. I mean, I was the, the head coach, <laughs> director of player personnel, the offensive coordinator, the co- quarterbacks and receivers coach I did. I was the equipment guy. I was, I mean, you, 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 and you know yeah. what? It's the best thing that ever happened. Yeah. And then fortunately for me, we were very successful as an expansion team. We actually played for the arena bowl championship. And then uh, that's what led to my job in the XFL and kind of got back in the outdoor game and, and then so on and so forth. And, and has a few other coaching stops prior to, uh, you know, joining this profession. Yeah. I, I, I coached in the Alliance of American football. So I know exactly what you're saying. And that, that kind of coaching gets you when you're really working with young men to to get themselves to that next level. Mm-hmm. You know, we didn't even have a full season, but the thing I enjoyed, I was in Arizona with at Arizona State is our home state, and we, yeah. we were out in Glendale. But you're right; there's so much stuff you have to do as a coach and an assistant coach in particular. I mean, it was like nights. I'm thinking, am I ever going to get in the bed tonight? Because <laughs> I'm just Buck, is I, film I, breakdown or something. It's the greatest. It's the greatest coaching experience in the world, and I'll tell you. And I'll tell you why. It's the rare professional coaching experience where you get to coach a professional athlete that is so hungry mm-hmm. that he'll actually listen and do what you're coaching him to do. Whereas at the NFL level, in many instances, you're probably coaching a guy that's been coached by ten of you, yeah. has heard yeah. it all before. You're not coaching that guy. You're putting him through practice. You're getting them through a game, okay? (laughs) But when you're in, whether it was the XFL the first time around that I was involved in the Arena Football League, I was in scouting with the Dallas Cowboys, but you're in those those leagues where you're not just the tight ends coach or the receivers coach, you're also responsible for player evaluation of that position. Oh, yeah. And then you're also responsible for setting up everything that goes on from a football operations standpoint within the organization, and it's on you. And one of the things that I liked about that was the responsibility upon winning and losing came solely upon the coaches. So, for example, and I don't know how it was in the Alliance, but the first time around in the XFL and the second time I know it was the same, the coaches were involved in every single decision that had to do with roster management. So there was never going to be a guy in a coat and tie that walked into our office and said, we're trading this guy, we're cutting that guy. And now we as a coach are at its mercy, right? So if we succeeded – we succeeded because we did a good job. If we failed, it was nobody's fault but our own. And I loved that. I, I really liked that part of it in selecting your own roster and drafting and, and nobody telling you how you got to do it. I mean, it was, that's the best way to coach. Yeah, we had, you know, a couple of guys, in particular Phil Savage, who had been around the league sure. a long time. And Phil was one of those guys that, you know, he ran the meetings, but it was always our input. You know, he mm-hmm. and uh, Trip McCracken were right there. They knew – every single thing about it and we had some he, they had some guys working under him as well that were really good uh evaluators to help but basically you were evaluating your position you have to yeah. make sure everybody goes the way they need to and take care of things there hey we're going to take a short break and we'll be right back with tom moving on chopping up with 
many people are looking for natural alternatives to help ease their aches and pains, begin stopping the pain with the help of Pain Stopper. Formulated by healthcare providers, Pain Stopper helps alleviate a variety of physical ailments so you can get back to doing what you love. Our products are triple independently lab tested to ensure the highest quality hemp available. Visit PainStopCBD.com for more information. Pain Stopper, because why manage pain when you can stop it? At Heslip Wealth Advisors, our goal is to help small businesses develop quality retirement plans for their employees through our Lunch and Learn seminars. We provide lunch and learning tools to help your company succeed and unmatched customer service. All right, we're back with Chopping It Up with Buck, with Tom Luganville, kind of talking about the coaching profession and everything else. Lugs, I'm going to take you back to a day that I remember when we worked together. And it, this was, I think, the start of some of the things we're seeing now, too, with athletes speaking out and, and people really understanding sometimes the underbelly and the culture of college football. I don't know mm-hmm. if you remember that Penn State episode with, you know, when everything happened and it all hit the fan. You were, I think, on, in studio that day. I was coming. I was in studio when it happened. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was about two hours away, so they called me. And usually they give me a few more days, but I had to get there and I had maybe 30 minutes to spare. We got on set and I, I can remember looking at you and we looked at each other and we said, this is college football is never going to be the same since this happened. And it was just, it was one of those days where you spent, you were sick to your stomach, but you were trying to do the best you could to cover everything that you could. And they mm-hmm. gave us some time to read the, the, the information that came out. And I, and I can remember to this day getting emails from people thanking us for how we covered that. And it, mm-hmm. but it was, it wasn't, I didn't feel good about that. I felt sick to my stomach because of all the things that happened. But I can mm-hmm. remember uh, even after that, you and I were just, I was spent when I went home that day. I, I was too. And I think the, the, the thing that you fear too, when you go on live television is you got to be particularly with that subject matter. You have to be so careful yeah. with the words you use, how you phrase things. Things, as we all know in this day and age, can be so easily misinterpreted or taken out of context. And then I think the other scary thing that I remember being really scared of, and I remember some of our producers getting in my ear, maybe prior to you arriving in the studio, was remember we don't know everything we're going to know yet. So we got to be careful not to speculate too much. And I can remember sitting there and hearing all this and then looking back on it several months later, realizing that even the things we were speculating weren't as bad, were, were not as bad as they actually were. I know. Like yeah. I, I remember going, I never even thought to go down that path. Oh my gosh. I like the, all the Mike McQuarrie stuff. Yeah, I mean, all, yeah. all of that stuff that ended up subsequently coming out, you're just sitting there going, okay, hope this is an isolated thing with one individual. And then it was anything but that. And you're right. It was, and it's, um, and again, the timing of all of that, right around where social media and the internet's mm-hmm. becoming this prominent fixture. So now information and misinformation and yeah. all of this stuff's out there and you've just got to be so careful, man. Yeah, and I, I think, I mean, that's the one thing you know, and I know as well, being on TV when you're doing live things, you know, everything you say can be misconstrued. But usually mm-hmm. you go on and you know what you're talking about, or you if you don't, you don't venture into that area, because if you do, right. it can come back to hurt you in the worst way. Get, you know, getting back to uh, the the XFL, you coached Tommy Maddox there, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, were you already gone, or did you play I- a year with Tommy? Tommy was young when I got to UCLA. He was uh, a freshman, I think, when I was a senior. I, I, he was, okay. you know, really starting to just get developed. But I know he was recruited there, came on campus, yeah. and he, he wasn't quite ready to get on the field. I think he had the red Tall, shirt first. Tall, kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Heck of an athlete, really a good golfer, could play some Great basketball. basketball player. Oh, yeah. man, he could, he could shoot it. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I, I was – I really thought he was going to have a long career, and I was glad after his XFL experience that he got another chance to play in the league as well. You know what, Buck? And, and he is a great story, and 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 I and I've often looked back on this. In fact, that's that's his serial right there from the Pittsburgh Steelers, <laughs> yeah. Tommy Gun Flakes, and that's from that's from the year after the XFL. He was the yeah. XFL MVP, and the next year. 
He was the NFL comeback player of the year. They went to the AFC championship game, ended up losing to New England. So anyway, so I still have that stuff. I have a picture of him right there. That's his XFL oh, yeah. uh, yeah. picture that's, yeah. uh, uh, that he signed for me. But anyway, so with Tommy, and it's funny, um, who was Sean LaChapelle? Remember Sean? Sean LaChapelle, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Tommy at that time is coming off of his redshirt sophomore year, all right? Mm -hmm. So when you're coming off of your redshirt sophomore year, particularly in those days, you weren't even thinking about entering the NFL draft, okay? Not even close. But all the ages at that time, and this is coming from Tommy. This is what Tommy said. Every, all the ages were telling me and Sean LaChapelle that if the NFL is going to institute a rookie salary cap, you got to come out. Excuse me. you got to come out now. you got to come out now. So he did. Yeah. Which, you know, you look back on, you know, it's a bit of a mistake. Still goes in the first round, all right? But he goes to, in the first round to the Denver freaking Broncos, all right? Now, understand, this is prior to those three Super Bowls that they went to, right? Yeah. And, and Elway does not take, take that too kindly either. No, exactly. So, <laughs> so everybody I, and, talks and, about Aaron Rodgers not liking guys, but, but, but can you imagine going to the locker room with John Elway? <laughs> Jeez, I mean, and, 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 but, and, I, and I, the reason why I bring that up is because yeah. I think people throw around the term bust way too lightly. I do too. Because I think in order to be a bust, you have to be a high draft choice and been given every opportunity to perform at a high level. Mm -hmm. No matter how many opportunities you've been given, you just can't get it done. Well, Tommy didn't really ever get that opportunity. So then eventually it's not going to work out in Denver. They trade him to, uh, to the New York Giants. And then, you know, Dan Reeves is there, and we went back in the XFL, started studying some of his NFL stuff and some of the scheme stuff. And what we found is he had a very brief stint in the preseason with a Mike Martz offense. And he was an entirely different guy than he was the guy that was on the field with the Giants and the, and the Broncos before him. So... Let me, re let me fast forward a little bit and rewind back to that point. So when we were studying him to draft him, we're like, okay, we know he's smart. We know he's done well with his money. What's your motivation to go play arena football? Okay. Which means you got to love the game. And not to mention, he, he signed an arena football contract with a team that wasn't very good. And I watched all 14 of his regular season games, and he flat got the snot knocked out of him. Yeah. And he kept tough kid. getting back he's up. always tough. Yeah. He kept getting back up. He kept getting back up. We're like, all right, this guy's got something. He doesn't need to play. He has money, and he's getting his tail kicked, and he keeps getting back up. We got to bring this guy out. We bring him out. We interview him. We do the whole workout. And I asked him at our lunch, I said, Tommy, I said, what do you not do well? And he kind of looked at me funny as if he'd never really been asked that question. I don't think he had that. And I said, and I need you to be honest with me. He said, I'm not a play action, drop back, 18-yard comeback, deep dig, you know, go through five progressions guy. He goes, I'm at my best when I get back, get my foot set, get the ball out, and bing, bing, bing. All right, now he's telling me this. When he's telling me this, I have not watched that film in training camp where he's playing in Mike Marks' offense. Okay. But I had watched – the New York and the Denver stuff. So what he's saying is starting to make sense. So then we go back and we watch him. And he tells us, he goes, the, my best chance would have been able to stick with the Rams because what Mike was doing was what I could do. And I never felt like in my career I was in an offense that was tailored around my skill set. So long story short, and not to take a bunch of credit here, but I, this was something I learned as a young coach. And I think it's there, there's so much ego involved sometimes. And everybody wants to sit there and say, oh, I got my system. I got my, my system. system. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't fit into my system. Screw your system. Quit trying to stick a square peg into a round hole. Your yeah. system needs to be whatever system your quarterback can operate. So we went to the drawing board at that time, and we literally sat down with him. Scott Milanovic was our other quarterback, and oh, we yeah. built the offense together. What do you like? What don't you like? All right, you don't like this? All right, that's out. We're not doing that. All right, how do you want to do this? How do you want – and we kind of built it. And – then it was our job to put good players around him. Fortunately, we were able to do that. Long story short, we win the XFL championship. He's the MVP. Gives him an opportunity to get back in the league. Well, then he goes to Pittsburgh, and Mike Malarkey is the offensive coordinator. And Mike Malarkey had the exact same mindset that we had had offensively. 
And he recognized real quickly with Tommy, okay, this is what we need to do with him. And that's why he was successful because Mike Malarkey, once again, didn't say he's got to be my system guy. Mike Malarkey said, okay, this is what we do to make this guy flourish. Yeah, that's crazy you bring that story up because we did the same thing with John Wolford and the uh, AAF. Yeah, and the AAF, you know, sure. We had, we had Trevor Knight and mm -hmm. John Wolford. Everybody was thinking that Trevor was going to be the starter. But I had told people because I saw John Wolford at Wake Forest. I yeah. said, this, this, little, this dude got some dog in him. He's, he's gonna a come out and compete. He's going to come out and compete. So we yeah. built an offense at RPO game. And we had a bunch of – and we brought him in because that's what he ran. So sure. he and Trevor both had those, you know, those, those systems that, that we took from them. But we mm – -hmm. I, I, I can remember. We had uh, – who was our coach who ended up going to uh, uh, Liberty? Hugh Freeze. Hugh Freeze, oh, was, Hugh our Freeze yeah. he was our offensive yeah. coordinator. Coming in, we were putting everything in. Hugh ends up getting a job at Liberty. We have to literally put together an offense in less than a week. <laughs> I think I mean seriously, we sat yeah. in there with all of us, all their offensive coaches, putting together an offense. And then when the quarterbacks got there, we had to make sure because there were some things we knew we wanted them to be able to call that made it easier mm -hmm. for them. And Rick just kept saying, Hey, we gotta make this simple because if we don't, we don't have the time to do everything else because we You're don't right. have the time with them. And it was That's unbelievable right. to watch those guys mesh in the offense. We had different different things that they could call it was it was unbelievable so it's funny to hear your story about tommy because that's the same thing we have you have yeah. to do that and i get mm -hmm. i get frustrated when i hear coaches say well this guy doesn't fit my system well he can play if, if you watch him he can do the thing just make your system well and if you hear him. a college coach say it it's really frustrating because then you're saying well why the heck did you recruit him then <laughs> yeah, exactly him? hey you know? so one thing I want to ask you, I mean, with, with everything that's going on, with George Floyd, with the social unrest, with, with everything with Black Lives Matter, you're around the recruiting game, but you also know some of these college guys and pro guys. How have they talked to you and your, and your folks when they're talking about some of this? Does it make a difference for coaches that if they don't know how to relate to them, uh, do, they, do they tell you the honesty or, or is it still they're so young they, they don't quite know what to say around that? i got to be honest with you. Kids haven't brought it up. It's been, yeah. it's been uh, like, I've, I've been to a couple of camps. We've started to reopen the camp structure on yeah. the road with obviously health parameters and safety parameters, but even, and, and then, but when you're, when, even when you're like talking to them or you're dealing with them, whether it's for us for the Under Armour All-America game, the, the, the kids themselves aren't really dialed into it. I mean, they're aware of what's going on. I think they're mm -hmm. also more so just in their own world, you know, mm -hmm. they're, they're, 15, 16, 17, or, you know, you rising seniors, rising juniors. And it maybe it hasn't had that personal effect or impact on them mm -hmm. that it's had probably on the majority of adults yeah. that have been involved. Because I think what's different about all of this is we, as contributing members of society, are all, we're, whether you're employed or you're in the workforce or you're out there, you're going to be in the middle of it. It's part of, it's part of our day-to-day -day life now. I think with kids, sometimes they get shielded from it, you know, whether that's right, wrong, or indifferent. Yeah. But I haven't seen, I haven't seen much of it. And I, and I don't hear, you know, I was talking to my dad who's now yeah. in, the, in the pro personnel or player personnel role at Arizona state. And, you know, and, and he and, and, and Herm and, and much of the staff there, most of the staff there is African-American. And quite honestly, they say, you know what? We don't bring it up much. If the mm -hmm. kids want to talk about it, if they ask about our culture, if they ask about, you know, all right, well, what percentage of our, our staff or our team is this or that, we're going to be open on it. We're going to talk about it. But aside from that, well, and this is coming from just that one particular staff, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. we're trying to recruit the right guys, build a right culture, and teach and guide kids to hopefully be in a society that doesn't have to deal with any of this. Yeah. He goes, that's kind of like our, you know, that's Herm's way of dealing with it is, well, let's provide something so these kids see another way so that yeah, they yeah. see that it doesn't have to be like what your parents are seeing right now or what's going on out there in social media. We have an infrastructure here and a way of doing this where we feel like, we can make you in this world a better place because of how we're going to groom. And then it becomes a part of the, of the recruiting side of it. But I think with a lot of staffs now, 
you have, you have such a mixture, you know, and especially on the West Coast, you know, Utah, you have a ton of Polynesian coaches on the staff. U of A does too. Washington mm-hmm. State, Oregon, Oregon State. So you've got white, black, Polynesian. You've got so many of, this, of these – of this melting pot of viewpoints and o- ability to relate with kids yeah. that there's yeah. always going to be on someone on your staff that maybe is the right fit for that yeah. particular kid. Did, did you ever, I mean, you've been around the game for a long time. Did you ever experience through the eyes of, of, of any of your black uh, uh, colleagues or teammates, any of that happening where they come to you and say, Hey man, this is, you know, I got stopped or you were with them and something happened where you were just like, man, that, you know, it's messed up. That you knew, I mean, you already know that there's a difference, but did you see sure. it or did you, yeah, did that ever happen being around the game as long as you have? I, I never had that happen in any type of social setting, any type of public setting, whether I was with my teammates, whether I was on a coach, on a staff, yeah. and we were out socially with players and we were at a restaurant. I didn't necessarily experience that. I will yeah. say this though. So, and you talk about different experience, different cultures, different teams, different dynamics and locker mm-hmm. rooms. When I transferred from Palomar College to Georgia Tech, that was not only a transfer to a different football program, it was also a transfer to a different footprint of our community and our culture and our country. Yeah, I hadn't yeah. spent any time in the South. Mm-hmm. Um, I had not, um, you know, I had not lived in the South. And, and I'll tell you right now, when I arrived at Georgia Tech, the incumbent starter was a guy by the name of Donnie Davis. He had started the year before, black guy. Mm-hmm. We roomed together, Buck. He was my mm-hmm. roommate. We're competing for the start job. White guy and black guy, all right? Was it easy all the time? No, we were both competitors. Yeah. Did – the team necessarily liked that the coaching staff went out and recruited a guy when they had a returning starter? Probably not. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'll never forget to this day, they bring us in, they make an announcement. They, they tell us, okay, Tommy, you're going to be our starter. Uh, Donnie, you got to be ready. You know, the, the normal difficult conversation they got to have. Imagine having to go back to the same dorm room. Mm. Okay. Went back to the same dorm room, and I honestly believe that this decision probably led to us not being as good of a football team because I, you know, I, I think there were a lot of players on the team that just resented the fact that that I was there, and it wasn't it wasn't my fault, it wasn't their yeah, fault. It was, it was a fractured team. It was a fractured team, and and them recruiting a junior college quarterback to come in when you had a returning starter in their mind sent a message, okay, and. Not one time, not one time did Donnie Davis ever bitch to the coaches. He never at one time treated me any different. He never was standoffish. In fact, we actually became pretty close and ended up reconnecting years down the line when he was playing in the Arena League for the Arizona Rattlers and I was coaching in the league. And the first time we saw each other, we gave each other a hug. You know, and it was. Yeah, I remember him playing in the league. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He was in Arizona. He actually ended up being able to make a bit of a career because he was Cedric Bonner's backup. Cedric got hurt and he played some games and it led to him extending his career. But anyway, Donnie was a great guy, textiles engineering kid, really smart. And when I ended up transferring from there, George O'Leary took the job. They started becoming more option oriented. You know what? Everybody benefited. I ended up having a wonderful experience at at Eastern Kentucky. Donnie ended up being that starter for his last year of eligibility, so he got to go out the way he wanted to. Was it an easy situation? No. Was it ideal for everybody involved? No. Mm -hmm. Was there any lifelong strain as a result of it? No. I mean, mean, think how easy it would have been for Donnie to just turn on me. Yeah. Okay. And then all of a sudden (laughs) – and then all of a sudden it creates animosity within me and I'm frustrated with him or the locker room or the dynamics. And that never happened. Now things didn't go the way we all wanted them to, but I, I, I think about that because that culture, that locker room was so different than anything I had ever experienced before. Um, it was a great learning moment for me. I learned, I tell people all the time, I went, won 22 games at the junior college level. We went one and 10 at Georgia Tech went nine and three at Eastern Kentucky my senior year. And I learned more about dealing with adversity, becoming a man, 
learning how to grow up in that one year of going one and 10 than I ever did in the other three, which were wildly successful. And it was because things didn't go well, yeah, you know, yeah. and the, unfortunately we're in this day and age now, as you know, Buck, when a kid is on campus or he gets recruited and he's on campus for a year or maybe less than a year or maybe two years, things don't go his way. What does he want to do? He's on transfer. transfer. The portal is uh, wide open. <laughs> yeah. Nobody wants to stick it out anymore. And like, you know, my whole thing was like when I transferred, we had a coaching change. They shifted to an option-based offense. I wasn't mm -hmm. an option. If that wouldn't have happened, I would have stayed there and said, well, I'm the best guy. Let's compete. So mine yeah. wasn't a matter of playing. I was already the starter. So, uh, but I, I see that and I share that story with a lot of kids sometimes that, listen, just because it's not happening right now for you doesn't mean that it's not going to happen. You, you got to play the thing out. Yeah. We'll take a short break, chopping it up with Buck. Buck, we'll be right back with Tom Moody. Hi guys, Didi Wong here, and as you guys may know, I am an international award-winning speaker, I'm an entrepreneur, and I love investing in amazing products out there, one of which is now Thin Energy. It is a plant-based beverage, it has really huge hydration benefits. My favorite is the Peach Passion. I am so excited about this project, it's called Thin Energy, please check it out. All right, we're back chopping it up with Buck with my man Ludes. Ludes, I see over your corner. I have a, a, a daughter who's an artist, and we started yep. talking about this. I see Abraham Lincoln looking yeah. at his fine self back there, and I know your daughter created that. So I was telling you during one of our breaks that mm -hmm. my daughter has a lot of stuff, but she wants to charge me. So I have, I'm actually going to put some stuff up behind me. But it's just neat to see your daughter's <laughs> you work. <laughs> well, I got to be honest with you. We got to we got to give the Arbuckles a lot of credit because. <laughs> You know, we had spent so much time together and I knew your daughter was an artist. And even when my daughter was probably just six or seven, we started realizing, okay, she might have this, a, a talent for this. And then when I came to you several months ago and said, hey, you know, who's that guy you had her working with, speaking of your daughter. And, yeah. and when you gave us the information, it was, it was, number one, it was, it was really neat because we got to go down and sit down with him. And we didn't realize that he took on a very select, small number of, of clients yeah. and most of them aren't at that time Keaton well, my daughter Keaton was 11 years old and he said you know what I'm gonna take her on it's been the best thing that's ever happened so she did that when she was nine she's 12 now she's really advanced to things but she's doing stuff so your daughter's at this level my daughter's na my daughter can naturally sit there and say okay there's Charles Arbuckle I can blink my eyes take a mental photograph and I could draw him paint him color pencil him the whole yeah. nine yards what she's learning now are abstracts, landscapes, all these other different things that she knew existed. She knew it when she see it, but she might not have known what the process was. Yeah, so thanks yeah. to you, we're getting all of that uh, stuff down. Yeah, basically my office is the office of a 12-year-old. <laughs> it's Jeeps, superheroes, football memorabilia. I got a pair of cowboy boots right there. Well, hold uh, that superhero thought. because Superman. We're yeah. yeah. There's me in junior college uh, at Palomar. Uh, there's Deadpool. There's my Jaws Funko Pop. They never know with me. Well, well, the cool thing about it is when you have an office and you spend so much time in it, you want to have – the. it has to be you. It can't be right. contrived. You know, like we see some people and they have an office and you know that's not them. <laughs> Dude, I got to I got to give you a recommendation while we're talking about that. About yeah. a year ago, I was actually at Georgia Tech. I was doing something for the ACC network on Jeff Collins' first year there and I went into their offices and all of their personnel guys had these long curved monitors. Ooh. Okay? They yes. curve like this. They're like 49 inches long. So they, they make you they make whatever you're watching look like a movie. Oh, wow. Right. And I'm looking at this. I'm going, what? And there we're watching tape. I'm like, this is the greatest thing in the world. So I came home. I started researching them. I got one. It's literally on the corner of my desk right here. It's hard to show you. It's right there. Completely changed my world for film watching. And then I've got my little halo, you know, light thing here. For, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Well, when we do TV stuff now in this world, Zoom TV is all from our house now. But yeah, I, I tell you what, man, it's, Going from the coaching profession to entering into broadcasting in this world, yeah. I went from always being at the office and always either being on the road to the last 14 years or going on 15 years at ESPN, 
um, because of the internet and some of the resources we have, I've worked for home for 14 years. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's been the, great raising the family. Yeah. Well, that's the scary thing with this year though, with COVID and you know, we were talking about it earlier, uh, you guys travel and there's yeah. been talk that, you know, we may have to do Remy games or maybe nobody in the I stands. Know. I mean, how does, I mean, you know, you guys, it's you, McElroy and pass still. Yeah. right? That's and especially team. for me as a field yeah. analyst, what do you do with a field analyst? Yeah. Right. <laughs> so I, I don't know. Like, I, none of us know what's yeah. going to happen. And you're, and you're so right. It's, it's okay. Well, we know we have the technology to do a room, you know, and I, I even thought about it. This is my crazy brain. I've even thought about like all of these shifts in our, in our work schedules and our work life and the realization of all of these companies, multi-million, multi-billion dollar companies that have come to the sudden realization that, wow, Maybe I don't need a 10-story building for my 800 employees. They can all work from home. And I fear the commercial real estate market is going to oh, get that's crushed. True. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because people are going to be like, I don't need this building. I don't need that office. I need to just have Zoom. And my people have internet at their office, in their home. They could all do their job. Now, think about that. And that curved monitor you have. Everybody. And my curved monitor. <laughs> yeah, because I'm, I'm getting you know, my Samsung. I'm telling you, you get off of this, and you're going to go look on the internet and grab you one. I am going to do that. Hey, so, no, and that's the thing that, that's, I think, scaring everybody, because we know the world can exist, mm-hmm. but do we want it to, you know, and, that, and you bring up a really good point. Well, we always do something at the end. I'm going to get you out of here uh, called the two-minute drill. March you down the field. We make it easy for you to score. So the lightning first, round. Okay. Yeah. Lightning round. Uh, iPhone or Android? iPhone. All right. Uh, superhero or supervillain? Superhero. Which one? Mm, Superman. <laughs> okay. You got Superman. <laughs> <laughs> you're marching down the field. You're, you're really, you're really going well. Longest touchdown you ever threw. Oh man. I had an 80-yarder my senior year at Eastern Kentucky. It was the longest one I ever had. Now, I had a bunch of 60 and 70-yarders in junior college. We were really prolific on offense. But the one at Eastern Kentucky is a big deal because we were predominantly a heavy run-based team. So we were a play-action pass team, and we were backed up inside our own 20, and we were able to come off a play pass and hit the old, you know, the old NCAA route with the dig and the post. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I, we high load the single safety and got the post. You got that safety peeking and Oh, yeah, nosy. he jumped that dig route and I went, <laughs> Yeah, I love it. I love it. Yeah, we used to love that with the post corner post on that, too. You can really oh, yeah. get them tall turned around. Hey, one other, uh, you got, you're moving down the field. We're going to call a timeout and keep you there for a short break real quick. But I got one for you because I know. How okay. many Jeeps do you own? Oh, boy. <laughs> All right. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> I own a 1979 Jeep Cherokee Chief. Okay. And a 1979 Jeep Grand Wagoneer, which is the car I got my, for my wife for her birthday three years ago. Mm-hmm. And since we work out of our home, or I do, I don't have a commute anywhere. So they're kind of daily drivers when we want to use them. And then we have two newer model Jeeps if we have long travel or we're doing something with the family. So I've got a 2020 Jeep uh, Black Gladiator, you know, the Jeep truck. And my wife has a four-door Jeep Wrangler, uh, a 2019. So we have the two old ones and the two new ones, and they all get plenty of love. How did you find a woman that loves Jeeps as much as you do? (laughs) Well, that's the thing. That's how you know, and I just had my anniversary on July 8th, 19 years. Happy anniversary. And that's how you know when you get married and you're getting ready to have kids, and the wife says, you got to get rid of the Jeep, Jeep." I am convinced that that's why Jeep came out with a four-door Wrangler. I agree with you. Because they knew all these guys are loving their Jeeps, and the girls are loving them too. Yeah. But then when the family time comes, bye. Now you got a four-door Jeep. The Jeep stays in the family. Everybody's happy. So, yeah, no, she's always loved Jeeps. In fact, she drove down to the the beach with some of her friends uh, this weekend, um, and she had had the top down, just cruising, sunglasses on, enjoying Jeep life. Ten-yard line, getting ready to go in. That's the easy one. If you don't score here, I don't know how else I can help you score. How many pairs of boots do you have? Oh, 13. (laughs) I have 13 pairs of boots. I have 13 pairs of boots. And I'm 
hooked on Tacovas right now. I know I'm you are. Buck, Tacova was not around when we used to do TV and always talk boots. So here's the beauty about Tacova. And I and I, I listen, I'm not sponsored by them. I get nothing from them. I'm just telling you how I found out about them and how legit they are. Yeah. So you know this about cowboy boots because you've owned them. Cowboy boots are not like shoes, right? So mm-hmm. if you're an 11 and a half shoe, all right, you're an 11 and a half shoe. But you might go to a store and try on a Justin boot or a Dan Post boot or a Lucchese or what have you. You might be a 12D in one, a 10 double D in the other. So you can't order boots online. All right, and you, you got to try win. them on. Yeah, you got to try them on, and you got to get them made for you eventually, too. When right. <laughs> so let me tell you what Tecova's done. What have they done? has somehow figured out that they guarantee that your shoe size will fit their boot. And if it doesn't, they send you a return envelope in the box, and they will you'll send it right back to them, and they will send it back to you for as many times as it takes for free until the boot fits you. Oh, I own man. six pairs of Tacovas. How about this? I've owned, I own six pairs. have not sent one pair back yet. They what? fit just like your shoe size. They're the only company I've ever seen be able well, to I'm getting some. I, I've heard people that have Tacovas love them, and I, I don't awesome. have a pair. And they're, ha- and they're half the price of normal boots because there's no middleman. It's all internet-based. Oh, man. All right, now. Well, you scored a touchdown. We got in the end zone. Luke, I appreciate you coming on, man. It's always good. We got to – hey, yeah. we got to talk – Next time where we can get together, this is why I started this. So we could sit outside. Stogie and brews. Yes. That's the next <laughs> that's the next iteration. We're gonna sit on that. We deck. could do one of these sitting on the deck. Exactly. That's what we're gonna and we'll do. We'll have Megan service some cocktails. Exactly. We'll have a great time. And that's that's All what right. we're gonna do moving forward because that's where you can really chop it up. Kevin lives right down the street from there. He can come and yeah. film it. It'll be it'll be outstanding. We're gonna <laughs> cool. do that. So, hey, man, appreciate you coming on. Uh, you got thanks it. a lot for your time. And uh, on this edition of Chopping It Up with Buck, we had Tom Luganville. Thanks a lot, Tom. Appreciate you and look forward to seeing you. A lot of fun, man. Hi, I'm Mike Gardner, founder of Thin Energy, the wellness energy that delivers each and every time. In six weeks that I've been taking Thin Energy, I feel fantastic. I lost seven pounds in the first week. You just squeeze it in, you take a shot, and you're done. Go get your joints, get you hyped, and get you ready. I feel great. Jump on, try Thin Energy. Drink it, live it. Many people are looking for natural alternatives to help ease their aches and pains. Begin stopping the pain with the help of Pain Stopper. Formulated by healthcare providers, Pain Stopper helps alleviate a variety of physical ailments so you can get back to doing what you love. Our products are triple independently lab tested to ensure the highest quality hemp available. Visit PainStopCBD.com for more information. Pain Stopper, because why manage pain when you can stop it? At Heslip Wealth Advisors, our goal is to help small businesses develop quality retirement plans for their employees through our Lunch and Learn seminars. We provide lunch and learning tools to help your company succeed and unmatched customer service. 